Hi, everybody. Um, it's always good to be able to start off with a Yogi Berra quote. I don't know the non-Americans, the audience, but he was either a baseball player or a great philosopher, but I think people largely remember. He once said, I'm getting this feeling of deja vu all over again. <laughs> and um, I'm kind of feeling like, you know the way that something new is old or something old is new again? At some level, with the Logo Project, we had an attempt at doing computer-based math a long time ago. We started, um, Seymour Papert started the project in the late 60s, which is probably before two-thirds of the people in the room here were born, and we really tried to get it out in the world in a bigger way in the 80s, 90s, and had some successes and had some, well, less than complete successes. But the, con the concept that started this all, um, Papert wrote this book called Mindstorms, which I'd highly recommend in case anybody here hasn't read it. One of the things he talked about in Mindstorms was this notion of math land. He says that looking around at high school language education, how do we teach French in the United States? You get kids together for an hour or two a week and you learn about phrases and grammar and you know, punctuation and stuff like that. And you do it for a few years and then at the end of a few years, French class is done. Um, Papert pointed out that uh, usually when telling that story, people neglect to say, but nobody learns French that way. That the effective way of learning French is you go to Paris for, you know, go to Paris and sit at the bistros for six months. And at the end of that, it would, you'd probably have a good chance of, of learning French. So he felt that if we want people to be learning math, just like you can, you can immerse yourself in French land in France, maybe you should be able to immerse yourself in math in math land. And he saw really that that was the point of thinking about the use of computers and the kinds of activities that we're doing. Is the idea is to construct a little world that would be math land, where the nature of the conversation in it would be to be, learn, to be speaking math in order to be learning math. Now, Papert also, part of what Papert was talking about then is this notion of we learn best by making, pers by making personally meaningful things. And what, he, there's a couple of big words that, one is constructivism and the other is, that Seymour coined is constructionism. What constructivism is, is following the work of Piaget, a lot of educators realize that kids learn best by making new models in their heads. Seymour added to this by saying that a good way to make new models is by making tangible artifacts. So one of the things that he figured is, is one of the properties of math land would be the, an environment where you could build mathematical artifacts. Now, yesterday, we, the, I should say at the beginning of this, I hope at the end of this we could get into a good debate. The most spirited debate yesterday seemed to be about where the quadratic formula fits in all of this. And, um, it's, it's actually, it's a really serious question because um, Papert, I think, would be moving way to the left of anybody in this room, is he not only would call into question everything that we think is the appropriate mathematics to be teaching, he'd actually call into question whether or not we have the mathematics that we should be teaching. What he suggested, actually, is maybe the mathematicians in the crowd should spend their time making a more learnable mathematics. And um, it's... Sounds like a bit of a joke, but one would argue that the logo turtle was Seymour's first attempt at making a more learnable mathematics. Now, if you catch him on a bad day, Seymour was a, Seymour's a topologi topologist by training, and he really felt that a better, more learnable mathematics would be around differential geometry. We saw a presentation this morning of talking about how the Descartes view isn't that good. Seymour wasn't a big fan of the Descartes view, but he was coming at it from a different direction. So what the turtle is about is it's this little creature that if you were a topologist, you'd be able to say is only dealing with its local state. But none of us really want to do that. It's just this cute little creature that you can do to make mathematical things. Now, um, what I'd like to show you is it's, I know you shouldn't do this at, at conferences. I'd like to show you a hobby project. This is turtle art. What turtle art is, is, well, uh, the brief, story of what turtle art is, is a few years back, I was rereading Papert's early papers, which date from the late 60s, early 70s, where he was originally describing turtle geometry. And 
I had forgotten how great it was, because what happened to Logo in the intervening years was all sorts of other good things that got added to it. But in the early days, it really was about just turtles and just turtles making images. So what I ended up figuring it would be a fun thing to do is bring back the early turtle geometry, but do it in a way with kind of modern programming techniques, because the logo of the day there, <clears throat> the way you interacted with the computer back in, in the early days was with the text dialogue. And in the modern way, um, actually, I may be getting old here. I was going to say by dragging and dropping. It seems like the real way is you talking to Siri, but we, we're not at that point yet. Is, so we made a drag and drop environment that was very much the old logo. I just pulled out a block that says forward 100. If I double click on it, the turtle goes forward 100. I could clear the screen and say forward 100, right 90. And I guess you guys should all know this because this was demonstrated with a presenter yesterday and one of his volunteers <coughs> where if we want to turn this into a square, you could just say, as we saw yesterday, is let's just repeat the forward 100, right 90 four times. Clear the screen. And you get a square. One of the most important concepts in programming is naming things. I'd like to say that I'd like to name this particular thing square. And let me make it a little bit bigger. If I... Well, um, should I, I'll, I'll rename it rectangle. <laughs> <laughs> On that screen? Because on that screen, it's good. So look there. <laughs> so now that I have a square, I can use a square in a bigger thing. I'm going to make a square and turn right 10. And those of you who have followed Logo, I have to do this more times than that, 36 times, and we'll just get a nice picture. Now, at some level you could say, what's the point? And I'm, I'm gonna try to motivate a little bit what the point is in this. Um, there's a trivial, non-trivial point in this. This is actually using numbers in an instrumental way. If I, when I changed the 100 to 150, it got 50% bigger. There really aren't that many real world activities, outside of maybe money, where you actually have 70, 80, 90, that are things in and of themselves. And the whole notion, part of the notion of Mathland is in a very early state, you want to start getting some number familiarity. Now, I should move a little bit quickly. When we did turtle art, originally, I, I'll admit that I didn't really know what we were doing. And turtle art was going to be one of three things. It was going to be either an introduction to programming, or it was going to be an introduction to math, or it was going to be a workshop for artists. So for the introduction to programming, I'll concede, Scratch is doing a great job. If you're looking for a simple introduction to programming, go to scratch.mit.edu. For an introduction to math, that seems really good, but I think you'll be finding in this conference and out in the math world, getting math teachers to think a different way about teaching mathematics is very, very hard. So what we decided to do is kind of back into just doing this to make artistic images, primarily because Artemis, who's sitting over there, moved in with me, and she's an artist by training and in spirit. So she convinced me that I could do art too. And these are just, these are just sample images that are built out of exactly the same blocks language that, that I was showing you. Now, we were told to give this presentation short, so I'm gonna go through a bunch of short snappers that are largely reactions, reactions and things for the audience to think about in the context of this conference. The first one is we should think really clearly about the role of teachers. A lot of materials of this kind try to take teachers as a necessary evil, and people are trying to make teacher-proof curriculum. Um, to me, that's kind of crazy, because education is something that happens between people. And I'd rather, me, I'd rather learn something working with a teacher than working with a machine. Now, keeping the role of teachers very important makes the professional development effort very hard, but it's a hard challenge and it's kind of really worth it. Okay, second point in the short snapper is the idea of, um, people talked a lot about com com computer literacy. I think we'd, we'd like to say that taken a bit further along than that and talk about computer fluency that if you really want to get into the kind of examples that people are presenting here, you've got to have a fluent use of the tool. 
because the emphasis isn't really about the tool, the emphasis is about the, pro the problem. And I think what we need to do is figure out a technique where we can, we can build environments and um, build context where fluency becomes possible. Um, this one, uh, another one, that's a little bit of a critique to the way the discussion has been going. We'll be talking about, about mathematics. Mathematics is the M in STEM, or the M in STEAM. Now, mathematics is good, but I think the nature of the things that are being talked about at this conference extend way beyond mathematics. And I think that we should be very sensitive to the fact that each of the letters in STEAM represent a different community with a different mindset and different sensibilities. That, strangely enough, um, I've done some work with the Lego company on their Mindstorms kit, and they think that the Mindstorms kit is a great STEM material. My own opinion is it's a great T and E material. They miss the end. That the Lego Mindstorms kit really has very little to speak to science and pretty much nothing to speak to mathematics. The flip side of that is if we're going to be building something that's going to be about computer-based math, a good way to get into computer-based math is have the activities have something to say to engineers, technologists, artists, and scientists. Um, this is, um, I'm running out of time. So when we're talking about, Conrad pointed on a couple of occasions that we really should be thinking about mathematics that people will use. Um, I, kind of agree with that. I'd like to add to the fact that if we're saying that people will really use, we should set the bar really high, much higher than shopping. We should be setting the bar for mathematics that people really use to include everything that people are likely to use in their grown-up professional lives, which includes a lot of stuff because there's a lot of different possible professional domains. And since I'm already running over, why don't I finish by talking about um, Conrad had a list of surprises that when he said he got into this, um, one of the things, I, on, I agreed with his surprise list for sure, but I think I got over them. There were two that I wanted to add to the list. One of them is I was very surprised to understand that the, the professional development problem is one of the hardest to solve problems in this whole thing. This is only gonna work if we get buy-in, and the only way to get good buy-in is to make sure it's, everybody involved in the process is with us on this. Um, the second thing that I was very surprised to find, and you should be aware of when, as, as this is playing out, is the scaling is really, really tricky. We got very, very good at making a pilot test work. We even got very good at making a scaled up once pilot test work. We've made lots of materials that work fantastic in one school and work quite well in 15. By the time it got to hundreds, we weren't talking to our audience. We were talking to the people talking to our audience. And that turned out to be a very, very, very hard thing to do right. Now, I said I was going to say one more thing, so let's count like Kennedy did in the debate and do one again. Um, I'd like to launch a challenge to some of the members of the audience. For this to work, we have to deal with assessment. And I think that everything that I've heard about assessment now will make it very hard for us to be true to our vision and um, be evaluated well by the assessment techniques of the day. What I think we need to do is, as Seymour was talking about inventing a new kind of mathematics, what we need to do is invent a new kind of assessment that has the properties of being something that we ourselves believe in and have the properties that the decision makers and the gatekeepers will believe in it too. And um, that seems like a really hard problem, but the talk that we heard yesterday seemed to point, uh, seemed to be pointing in a very good direction. So, um, I think that I'm going to give up because they asked me to talk for about now, and should I sit there now? And I, I hope I said something that will lead to a lively debate after the next little talk. Thank you. Brian, if you, Brian, if you just stay there, we've got a time for a few questions if anyone has, okay. has any. You can stay at the podium. Any questions for Brian? There's a couple of points <clears throat> I'd like to examine a little more closely. First of all, the assessment. I happen to be teaching a course in robotics right now, and they said, well, how are you going to grade? And I, th I took back because I was focused so much on how they were going to learn that I didn't think about how they are going to grade at the moment. 
And so I decided I'm not going to grade. I gave them all A's. They haven't finished the course yet. But what I did do is each day I'm sitting with each one of them and getting a chance to see where they are. So if you want an assessment, I can tell you the assessment, you know, precisely. Uh, so I question the whole assessment thing. It's driving our whole system. And who looks at the grades? I, I've taught uh, calculus and physics and math at, at uh, Carroll College and uh, after I retired. And I never really look at the grades. They, they look like some administration that's been... So I don't know who's, who's, who's watching the who. Um, let me agree and say that I think that the thing that we need to do, which is a very hard challenge, is a thing that we occasionally have to face is you say to the Minister of Education, we've got a different vision, and the Minister of Education says, prove it. And I think that it's within, hopefully, we can pull together enough cleverness to be able to come up with something, because deep down in our heart of hearts, we, we've done a lot of work with a lot of teachers and a lot of kids. The reflex, my gut feeling is this kind of approach really, really works. What we haven't done is figure out how to convey the fact that it really, really works in a sufficiently formal way so that we can go to the political decision makers and say, look, it really works. Because the political decision makers now are by and large looking at assessment processes, they're measuring things fairly narrowly. And to the extent that we have positive outcomes, those positive outcomes are extremely broad. And because they're extremely broad, they're very hard to measure. Like, how do you know? My guess is the fact that we did logo back in the 80s caused there to be a blip of a few percent of the number of people that went into computer science when they grew up. I have no idea how you could measure that. Well, one thing we can measure, uh, which Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan has reported, that our dropout rate in high school now is between 25 and 30 percent. That's a measurable quantity. I don't think that represents success. To me, that's drastic failure. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think you nailed the three, your three surprises nailed for me. I'm a high school educator. I teach math and also a robotics course as well, so uh, I definitely empathize with what the last questioner said. Um, specifically on the assessment issue, one of the most frustrating things, maybe the most frustrating thing for me as an educator, is that in assessment we are asked to do two uh, incongruous things. Uh, we're asked to measure a student's progress on a set of objectives and we are also asked to grade. And if you think about the word grade, you know, what is that, that connotes a slope, right? We're, we're expect to rank students. And a grade of an A, B, C, et cetera, looking at that letter tells you nothing about what that student knows and does not know. Um, and maybe this is a question toward college admissions people, but as a teacher, I would love to assess my students and what I mean by that is to be able to, I wish my report cards, my transcripts for my students would say, student X knows how to do this skill, does not know how to do this skill. Does know how to do this skill, does not know how to do this skill, right? And maybe to a certain degree. Um, as opposed to A, B, C's, and D's, because I feel as though we want to engage our students. We want our students to take these difficult courses, these STEM courses, but the students that I have are so focused on their grade that they are not willing to take the courses that they are going to perceive as, that they're going to get poor grades in because they're difficult. We don't want students not to do difficult things because of a grade. We want students to be able to be in an environment where they can fail and be assessed and try again and iterate and, and not have this focus on grade. And so I guess my question, and Brian, maybe it's not to you, but if you could comment on it is, how do we move away, how do we satisfy the need to give college admissions, the information they need, while at the same time assess our kids in a true fashion that doesn't bias them as to what courses they take. I, I think if there was a quick answer to that, we would have already been acting on it. So the, the question is, is what is there out there that may be a source for a little bit of hope? That it's... We don't really have that problem, or at least not quite yet so severely, in either kindergarten or graduate school. 
that somehow in kindergarten and graduate school, and in a lot of art programs and in a lot of other um, pro a, a lot of other non-technical programs, there's a kind of assessment that's being done in a much more portfolio kind of way. That in a much more looking at thing, looking at the kind of big picture kind of outcomes that we're looking for, the hard problem that there's no magic answer to is, all of us. I hope all of us are living in democracies. In order to actually convince the decision makers that we would like to see a fundamental change in assessment, is probably going to require some political action, and it's probably going to be required to say to the politicians that we think that there are certain aspects of our educational system that would be much better served by promoting creativity rather than by promoting narrow outcomes. the assessment question because the, it's very easy to, to pop at assessment but actually assessment we live in a very credentialist society and you're not going to get away from assessment which means I think you have to address fairly and squarely the question of how you make that a productive and a valid assessment that doesn't suppress learning and, and one of the things we do a lot of is we assess English language skills for people who for whom English is not the first language and there's a very well and clearly defined construct of, of competence levels in English language skills against reading writing um, speaking and listening and actually there it is regarded as a positive thing that people teach to the test because the test is sufficiently well constructed and it represents the, the, the construct of the area that you're trying to teach sufficiently well that teaching to the test is an assured way of getting people up to the required level of competence and I don't see listening to all of this discussion why that shouldn't be possible in, in the context of the sort of mathematical thinking that we're talking about but it does require constructive engagement with it as a problem rather than just writing testing off and saying that we, we, you know, we need to make, move away from it to get to an authentic educational experience. Because I think realistically we do not live in a society where you're going to get away, with, get, get away from testing. And that means you've actually got to make it work for you in a constructive educational way. And I, coming back to your comment about you know, there's a lot of brain power involved in this, that seems to me a legitimate challenge for that brain power to get stuck into and one that it ought to be more than, than capable of do, dealing with. Um, Thank you. I wasn't suggesting that we tried to get away from assessment. I was almost suggesting the reverse. As a citizen and a taxpayer, I'd like to know that the educational system is doing something that makes sense for it to be doing. What I'm questioning is the particular assessment that we're doing is moving the educational system in a direction that I think is not the optimal direction for society. Now, the example you gave of English as a second language is a good example because there probably are domains in which teaching to the test can work. Deep down inside, I don't believe that you could do that in an art school. Because I don't think you could do it in an art school for very similar reasons, I don't think you could do it with mathematics. That mathematics is not about learning the quadratic formula. It turns out that learning the quadratic formula is when Conrad was saying math versus math. It's kind of on one side of those and isn't on the other and gets a lot of play precisely because it's something that makes it easy to teach to a test. Thank you, Brian. Um, a round of applause for Brian. Thank you very much.